Hello everyone. Sorry I'm late. Um, again. Uh, say two minutes late. Anyway, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this Aim High Live. If you are just joining now, then jump into the chat. Um, I wonder if I've actually got this chat working. I'm going to type something. Hello. <laughs> ah, people are in already. <laughs> Hey, hey Mirdon, welcome back. Hey Pumpkin Master. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for coming guys. Uh, today is going to be about uh, the universe and if the universe is expanding, what's it expanding into? Um, I'm just going to flip over to the first uh, screen. Hello. <laughs> um, if the universe is expanding, what is it, what is it expanding into? Um, if this is the first time you're joining, then this is an Aim High Live. Um, so it's like this kind of science lesson um, that's going to take a route around various different ideas um, and throw in questions whenever you want to change the change the pace and change uh, what we're talking about. And if you can, if the questions are really good, I'll just end up talking about stuff that's quite, actually quite different to what the original plan was, which will be fine because it'll still be interesting. Um, so uh, here is. Yeah, um, first question, <clears throat> if the universe is expanding, what's it expanding into? Um, but first, what's this little guy? <laughs> Who's this? Who dis? <laughs> Does anyone recognize what this is? I'm gonna label it in green. Who dis? Where's my pen? Ah, okay, and I've got a message coming in from Kieran saying, hey, any chance these can be recorded so us down in Australia can watch them and not at 11 p.m.? Yes, if you go on uh, the website, which is just kind of here, do, 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 there, uh, www.aimhigh.co, um, then they're all recorded on there, or lots of them are. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to see the recorded ones, then go to the website and you'll, you'll find them all. Um, in there. Uh, but yes, I also think we should maybe do them a bit of a different time because it must be so late in New Zealand as well. Um, <coughs> okay, so... Uh, <laughs> wait, what? Okay, it's Izzy, Izzy Rose is saying it looks like a quokka. Uh, it does look like a quokka. It's not a quokka, but that's a good idea. Um, <coughs> and... And oh, the Pumpkin Master is talking about, okay, so yesterday we were talking about, just to fill people in who weren't here yesterday, yesterday we were talking about um, the story of the top hat, and this is so good. You should find this out, uh, you, should, you should go and read this online. The story of the police report that was filed the first time a top hat was worn in public, and it was this guy called John Hetherington, and it's on Wikipedia, and it's about all the chaos that was caused, and uh, the fights and arguments that broke out, and it's a really great story. I definitely recommend checking out the story of the top hat on Wikipedia on, a, on its, uh, its, its beginnings. Um, <clears throat> anyway, right, so have we got any answers? So Jasmine thinks it might be some brand of marsupial, some brand. I love the way you use the word brand. Um, <clears throat> speaking of brands, have you guys ever been anywhere in the world that did not have Coca-Cola advertising somewhere? I'm just going to add to this animal some Coca-Cola advertising just to bring it in sync with the rest of the world. Um, I, I once went to this like really, really, really obscure, isolated place in the middle of, um, in the middle of, of uh, the kind of Bolivian um, <coughs> kind of salt, salt flats. And I was like, right, we're pulling into this village, surely. And the, f the first thing I thought is, this is probably gonna be the first place that I've ever been to in the world that doesn't have Coca-Cola advertising. Pulled up stopped outside this wall and on this dusty wall was just a big painted on coca-cola advert and i was just like oh no um <coughs> uh, someone wants it to be a nike nike marsupial um this is something that i use to explain um extinctions with with coca-cola because uh, a lot of people think oh we don't need to worry about so and so an animal because it's not it's not going extinct because there's still loads of it like over there in that in that place in the world um but you know, Coca-Cola, as, as you know, has, has got advertising all over the world, but 
if the advertising from Coca-Cola started to disappear from a few regions, like it all disappeared from, say, Northern Europe, and it all disappeared from South America, and all of it disappeared from Japan, you would start to think that there's something worrying going on with Coca-Cola, right? That the, that the company's collapsing. Well, we need to apply similar thinking to, to animal populations and think, well, if they, it might, they might not be going extinct, but if they're collapsing in certain parts of the world, that's worrying in itself. So that's why a lot of biologists try to get people to think about what are called local extinctions. Where's my mouse? Um, <clears throat> local extinctions are in many ways more important than well not more important but like very very important things to think about anyway right what do people think this is um so lots of people saying it's marsupial uh jeff's saying sorry he's late absolutely fine mate uh we haven't started about if the universe is expanding what's it expanding into yet all i ask so far is what is this animal and the answer is i wonder if there's anyone from south africa watching because this is a south african animal um that i call well it's called a hyrax um, but I think in South Africa they call them dassies as well. I think they're called dassies. <coughs> um, <coughs> but yeah, it's it's a it's a hyrax or it's a it's a rock rock hyrax. Um, so uh, does anyone know um, what people think? Uh, so, sorry, does anyone know what the closest living genetic relative is to the rock hyrax or the dassie? What do people think is the closest living genetic relative? And I think, um, oh, Sean's just come in with Hyrax question mark. Yes, Sean, you are correct. <laughs> that is a Hyrax. Um, I don't know if that was your guess. And hi, Mariella, welcome. Um, so yeah, if you're, <coughs> well, um, I've just asked people what they think the closest genetic relative is of the Hyrax. And if you're joining us late, this is an Aim High Live. And this one, the question is, if the universe is expanding, what's it expanding into? But we haven't started talking about that yet. We just talked about the story of the top hat and how it, how it was originally released into the public. Great story with this featuring this guy, John Hetherington. Read about that afterwards. And now I'm asking the rock hyrax, this creature here, um, which will give some spectacles to go with, go with this top hat. Um, what's its closest living relative? Um, and so we've got Llama from Jasmine, Jeff saying Groundhog, Oliver is saying Beaver, Kieran Raccoon. Okay, Victor and uh, Izzy are both spot on. It's an elephant. It's an elephant. Um, the Hyrax's closest living ge genetic relative is an elephant, which is kind of unbelievable. And it's second closest. Ah, oh, let's see. Okay, so if especially those who got this right, because there were two answers that were totally spot on. Does anyone know what its second closest living relative is? Um, <coughs> yeah, I wonder if anyone knows. Um, and uh, Mariella as well also just joined. Don't worry, we've, we've not started talking about the big question yet, which is if the universe is expanding, What's it expanding into? So I'm, I'm asking quite a niche question, which is, what is the rock Hyrax's second closest living relative? This is kind of like, uh, has anyone ever had someone, you know, you, know, you know when you get to that age and it's usually around like six or seven where you like love making lists of things and you're like, okay, this is my favorite um, thing and this is my second favorite thing and my third favorite thing. And you know, has anyone had recently someone who's around that age come up to them and be like, hey, what is your, like, what is your second favorite hobby? And you're like, okay, thinking through my list of hobbies. Don't know. I don't know what my second favorite hobby is. Um, anyway, okay, so um, Kathleen's saying hi from Australia. Hi, we are getting quite a lot of people from Australia in. Okay, I will, maybe I will run a few of these earlier sometime. Um, could switch them to one, I guess. <gasps> Jasmine's just come in with manatee as the second closest living relative of the Hyrax, which actually I think is bloody close. I think it's. I think well, I was thinking manatee or dugong, um, <coughs> which are those. Which are those two kind of aquatic mammals, and they are the other things that are really close living relatives of a Hyrax. Bloody great! Pumpkin master coming in with giraffe. Giraffe is not right. Um, and uh, wait, Toby Lockhart just joined as well, asking. And also, you're in Australia. Uh, <coughs> okay, lots of people joining late. I'm going to do one more summary of what's going on before we launch into it. So this is an aim high live. Ask questions whenever you want. I'm teaching about if the universe is expanding, what's it expanding into? At the moment, we're talking about this Hyrax. 
<laughs> what its relatives are in in the animal kingdom. And its closest living relative is an elephant. Second closest is like a dugong. Or I think manatee is quite close as well. We were talking about local extinctions and Coca-Cola, but not going to go back to that. And we were also talking about the history of the top hat. Guys, check out the history of the top hat online. It's really funny. Um, <clears throat> and yes, dugong. Dugong. Um, okay, so... <laughs> Right, cracking on to, I'm going to do, right, I'm going to get, I'm going to go into this um, PowerPointy thing. I wonder if I can do this actually. Give me a sec, guys. I wonder if I can do this in a way where it's not going to cover up. I think we're going to have to just keep flicking in and out of it. I think that's going to be the way. Okay, so first question is, how tall is an elephant? How tall is an elephant? out of 10. How tall is an elephant out of 10? What do people think? <coughs> and <coughs> yes, while well, people are just starting to answer how tall is an elephant out of 10, um, I will, it's 11.13 p.m. in Australia, I'm gonna start eating this orange. Okay, I'm not getting any answers so far of how tall is an elephant out of 10. So I'm just going to come straight in with it and say six out of 10 is pretty solid. Now it's four out of 10. It's four meters out of 10. Um, so yeah, it's about the same height as T-Rex, which is a good, good four meters or so. Now, if you shrink a T-Rex and an elephant down to that size, you get this. What do people think that is? A solid 9 out of 10 from Oliver. <laughs> um, so, <coughs> uh, level like 6 out of 10, 5.6 out of 10. It's like 3.5 meters tall at shoulder height, says Jeff. Um, yeah, so an elephant. Elephant's four. Um, yeah, what, what do people think that tree is? And while people are wondering what the tree is, Mm. Okay, so there's a lot of people coming in with the tallest tree ever. <laughs> and people want to see the tree again. Okay, the problem is I haven't figured out how to show you the tree whilst also be able to, being able to read the chat. I've got to work on that. Oh, I feel like my internet's running a bit slow. I'm going to show you the tree and I'll be right back. I'm going to move the internet to a faster place. Okay, come back. Let's see what people say. Redwood. Yes, it's a redwood tree. It's a giant redwood tree. And a giant redwood tree is going to be, um, how, it's going to be 100 meters tall. So if we zoom out from a giant redwood tree that's about 100 meters tall, then compared to that, it's about this size compared to that building. Now, do people know what that building is? is what do people think that building is now i'm just going to come out of here so that i can draw some stuff oh in fact let's draw it here so while i'm waiting to find out what people think that building is um that's way taller than a giant redwood tree i'm just going to give it another draw even though i can't oh my god this drawing's so bad <laughs> Anyway, whatever, there's the tall building. It looks like a kind of floppy rocket that you just, if someone invited you aboard that rocket and were like, come on, we're good, space, climb aboard. You just wouldn't get in, would you? You would not get into that rocket. Um, okay, yeah, it's the Burj Al Khalifa. Um, Mia Doan's coming in with, and that's right. So does anyone know, did anyone know that the Burj Al Khalifa is one of the only places in the world that you can see the sunset twice? Why do people think you can see the sunset twice from Burj Khalifa? And while I am finding out what people think about that, I'm just going to go to the next bit of size. So yeah, if we bring back the Burj Khalifa and we, that's about 828 meters and we shrink that down to that tiny little thing, um, then if we compare that to this, what do people think that is? 
going to go back to the Burj Khalifa. Um, and yeah, so the Burj Al Khalifa is the building in the clouds. Why do people think you can see the sunset twice there? Any ideas? And Jeff's coming in with the guess about the Mariana Trench being that thing that I just showed you on that spot on as well. Um, okay, so Milo is thinking that you can see the sunset from the bottom floor and then take the lift up to the top floor to see it again. Exactly, that's it, yeah. So this is one of the few buildings in the world that is both tall enough and also has a fast enough lift that you can see, if this is if these are the hills at the, on the horizon, then you can see the sunset Obviously, the sun is not literally behind the hills, but pretend that it is. You can see the sun kind of disappear behind the hill down there. And then you can get the lift up to the top really quickly, so fast, in fact, in this building that you can then see over the top of the hill to where the sun has disappeared. And then you can watch it disappear again. Um, and I think I've, I only know of two places in the world where you can do that. And one of them is um, in in... Uh, is here and the other one is is in uh, Cheshire on a, on a hill called the cloud sometimes the Sun kind of sets behind it and then unsets and then sets kind of outside again anyway um, right so and Toby Lockhart saying yeah you can see the horizon further and, and that the lift is really fast I'm not sure how fast the lift lift is but it's probably about light speed uh, right okay so crack it on um, this is the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest, um, the deepest part of the ocean. Um, okay, here's a question. If you, right, you know that film Monsters, Inc., where they have those doors that go to other doors? If you were to get one of those doors um, and you were to open it up at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, so you just open it up at the bottom, and the other half is going to, like, Mars or somewhere, just, like, somewhere in space where the water can just, like, drain out endlessly... How long do you guys reckon it would take to drain the whole ocean? How long would it take to drain the whole ocean through the bottom of the Mariana Trench if you could open up a, like a door-sized space? Um, what, kind of, what kind of time frame do you guys reckon? I'm really interested to know what you think. Um, anyway, so the Mariana Trench is about 11 kilometers deep. Um, and it is about the size of this rock. They don't know what that rock is. Big old rock. I'm going to just catch up on the comments from there. Okay, so... Um, so, Mirdon's saying that the people on the top floors have to wait for an extra two minutes or so to start eating. Exactly, yeah. So, um, during, during the festivals where you're not allowed to eat at the festivals and religious uh, periods when you're not allowed to eat during sunrise, you have to wait for longer if you're at the top of the Burj Khalifa. Um, sorry, not allowed to eat during the sun being up. Um, and Toby's, <laughs> Toby's saying that he saw a car advert where they watched the sunset and then drove to the top of the mountain to watch it again. I don't know. Is that possible? Maybe that is possible. I don't know if any car can drive that fast or if any ma ma mountain is sufficiently vertical, but maybe um, as in vertical and drivable up. OK, so we got some guesses coming in for how long it would take to drain the oceans through the through a little through a door sized shape at the bottom of the ocean, like a Monsters Inc. door at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Um, and so we got like three minutes, quite a while from Izzy Rose. <laughs> Nice, is he? <laughs> nice. Uh, a decade, two days, one day. Okay, so there's quite a range. Uh, Mere don't think a billion years. Um, so we, this this hasn't. It's very difficult to calculate this exactly, uh, but it would take on the scale of tens of thousands of years. The ocean is so big. It's so there's so much water there that even with with this plug hole, it'd still take tens of thousands of years to to drain the whole ocean. Um, <clears throat> so we might as well just do it. We might as well open up the door at the bottom and just, just get on with it. Um, anyway, I'm going to crack on because otherwise I'm never going to get to uh, to the to space and it's expanding. Uh, <coughs> okay, so uh, what's coming next? Right, we're continuing to do the size of things. So I asked people if they knew what this rock was. Um, that is the same size as the Mariana Trench, uh, 11 kilometers, and this rock is Phobos, the moon, and it's a moon that is kind of 
around the right size that you could easily throw a, if you were stood on it, you could, you could take a baseball and you could just throw it straight off the moon. Or you could probably throw it just right so that it kind of like goes around the moon and then comes back and you can catch it behind you. Probably. Um, <clears throat> anyway, if we shrink down that moon, um, then we can change it to this moon, which is called Charon. Um, and this is, I think, the moon of Pluto, if memory serves. Suddenly I'm getting worried about this, but I think, I think it's the moon of Pluto. Um, anyway, it seems pretty big, but still we're only the size of Italy, so I'm going to start speeding up. Um, right, so if we make that moon of Charon much smaller, then we get to this, which is obviously the Earth. Um, and the Earth is 12,700 kilometers. Now, if we shrink the Earth down to that size, does anyone know what this is? What is that space there? What do people reckon? What's that space that's much bigger than the Earth? I'm gonna see what people are saying in the chat. Um, and Paul Janus or Paul Janus just said, hey Matthew, I'm a student studying astrophysics at the moment. Tell me something cool I may not know. <laughs> How do you know about Gomez's hamburger? We're about to look at that. Um, I don't know, have you done about dark energy and dark matter yet? Because we're going to talk a little bit about that if there's time. Um, I... Hmm. God, you've put me on the spot here to tell you something cool about space. The what? Okay, there is something really cool I was looking at in space recently, and I can't remember exactly where it is, but there's this thing in space called the um, cosmic microwave background radiation that is that basically comes seems to come from every part of space and gives space a kind of uh, a temperature. So it looks like space is a certain heat everywhere, and I, I say heat, it's actually really, really cold, but still it, it seems to never fall below a certain temperature because you've always got this micro background radiation coming at you from every single angle. But there's one point in space that is significantly colder than the micro background radiation, and I've forgotten exactly where it is or what it's called, but it's like a really mysteriously very, very cold region of space, and I was looking into that recently, it seemed pretty cool. Um, Okay, so uh, what do people think this big blue patch is? Uh, space, so Kieran thinks it's the space between the moon and the earth, uh, and Fatima's thinking the surface area of seawater, Oliver's thinking the surface area of earth. Um, no, it is actually um, the size of, if I can get it back, that is the size of the Minecraft universe. If you were to actually explore all of Minecraft, then it would it, you'd have to cover that much ground compared to the entire size of the Earth. So it's pretty um, pretty big old explorer on your hands. Anyway, cracking on, 6, 64,000 kilometers. I'm gonna have to speed right up now. Um, so 64, that's the Minecraft universe compared to the sun. The sun's pretty big, um, but actually our sun is really small when you compare it to much bigger stars like Polaris. So Polaris is the pole star. You might have seen this, you know, when you're looking um, uh, in the night sky, you have that classic constellation that looks kind of, this, this you can only see in the Northern Hemisphere, but you have that constellation that looks kind of like a, a saucepan, like that, and it's called the plow. And if you follow these two stars, then they point you to a very bright star up here which is called, it's a bit further than that, but it's called, yeah, more like, more like up here, a very bright star up there, which is the pole star, Polaris. And this star is always exact, or almost exactly north, so you can use it to navigate. And that star is, um, yeah, is, is that big. It's like crazy big compared to, um, compared to the sun. Uh, anyway, if we take Polaris and we shrink that 40 million kilometers right down to that, then we can get to like a properly big star like Canis Majoris, which means the big dog, um, which is pretty big and yeah, doesn't really, doesn't, doesn't really bear thinking about, does it? It's a bit, bit terrifyingly big. Anyway, if we shrink that right down, then we get to this, which is called a light day. Now, a lot of you will know what a light day is, but I just want to see if people know in the chat, um, what, what do you guys think a light day is? Um, because some people think it's a unit of time and it's not a unit of time. What do people think a light day is? Throw your comments into the chat. Pumpkin Master saying, Canis Majoris looks like the Japanese flag. Pretty sure that's where they got the inspiration from, from the expedition. Did you hear about 
so I'm eating an orange. Um, you guys might have heard about when the North Koreans claimed to have sent an astronaut. This might actually, this might have just been me being fooled by some fake news on the internet, but I'm pretty sure that Kim Jong-un um, claimed that North Korea had sent an astronaut to the sun. And not only was it totally mental that the astronaut had gone to the sun, but they did it in like a day. It took like a day, just popped up to the sun, popped back down to the earth, jobs are good and fine. Um, okay, yes, so people are coming in with great answers about uh, what a light day is. Uh, so it's the distance light, light travels in 24 hours, it says cast, and uh, yeah, it's Jasmine saying how far light travels in a day. Exactly. So a light day is the distance that light travels in one day. Um, and that's because it's, yeah, light is going the fastest that anything anything can go. Right. So um, that's that's a light day compared to the biggest star. So actually, it takes like takes a good part of a day to, to get, get yourself past Canis Majoris. It's a bit, bit of a journey on, even for light. Um, Anyway, if we make a light day really, really tiny, and we zoom it down to that, then compared to that, this is a something called Gomez's Hamburgers, which is a cool thing in space, which is made of shiny light matter with very dark, non-reflective non uh, matter, non-emittive matter on the inside. Uh, and it looks like a delicious hamburger in space, and that's that. Uh, and I'm just gonna speed right through these now. Uh, and then if you shrink down Gomez's hamburger really small, then you can compare that to this, which is something called the Oort cloud. Who knows what the Oort cloud is? There was someone on here who's studying astrophysics um, who probably knows what the Oort cloud is. What do you guys reckon? And Jasmine's asking, what happens if you go faster than light? Well, the problem is you can't even go at the speed of light without becoming light yourself. Um, so, to go faster, you can't go faster than light. But theoretically, if you could, if you try and run the maths where you're going faster than light, then the only thing that works is if you're then traveling backwards in time. Um, so actually, we're gonna talk about that in a moment. Um, and Jeff's saying there's a bigger star called UY Scooty. There may well be a bigger star. Um, that's, yeah, Canis Majoris, I just think, has got a great name because it's the big dog. Um, okay, no one's coming in on what they think the Oort cloud is yet, so I will, and maybe there'll be one that's slightly, say, I ought to know. <laughs> this is pretty wild. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, the Oort <laughs> the Oort cloud, great pun. I'm totally incapable of puns, so I always admire people who can pun. Um, the dust cloud shadowing some star. And, okay, so Mirdon's saying it's the dust cloud shadowing some stars. So, yeah, the Oort cloud is, uh, we usually refer to it as the dust cloud surrounding our star. So whilst the sun might be like a tiny pixel in the middle in all of our solar system kind of like this, this is the region of dust that our sun still has some influence over and it'll still kind of drag it all together. Anyway, that's two light years across. It takes two years for light to get from one side to the other. Now, if we shrink that right down and compare it to this... Um, then this is the Tarantula Nebula, which is a crazy bright region in the sky that if it was as close as some of the stars in Orion, um, we were talking about Orion the other day, that's one of the constellations you get in the, in fact, I think you can see Orion in Australia, um, close to the close to the horizon. Um, but if, if the Tarantula Nebula were as close as some of the stars that are in Orion, then it would be, um, like Betelgeuse, I think is one of the closest, um, then it would be so bright that it would cast visible shadows on planet Earth during the nighttime and during the daytime. Um, so yeah, the Tarantula Nebula is crazy, um, crazy bright, and that's 600 light years across. Now, if we shrink that right down, then we can compare it to this, which is a little galaxy called the Large Magellanic cloud, which is a little galaxy, little kind of mini galaxy that orbits our galaxy. That's 14,000 light years across. And obviously we shrink that down and we compare it to this, which is the Milky Way, which is 120,000 light years across, which means if you were to um, send a text message uh, from here uh, to your friend on the other side, 
uh, and then they were to text you back, then how long would it take you to get a reply from them, assuming that you know they don't want to seem too keen, so they're going to take maybe like a day, day to get back, day to reply or something? Um, how long would it take you to to receive a, a message back from from your friend? Um, see what see what people think. Um, and VH is here from Australia too. Yeah, I uh, oh, yeah you can I thought I thought you could see it in Australia. It's just low low on the horizon, isn't it? Talking about Orion here and how you can see it in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and the pumpkin master saying, I can't fathom this size. That's the thing, like, these sizes are so big. That's why I've kind of, this, this is taking slightly longer than I thought it would. But I wanted to, like, go step by step so that when we get to, like, the size of the universe, you can see what, um, <laughs> you can see what we're talking about. Uh, but it is getting pretty scarily big, isn't it? Um, oh, I just saw that Paul came in with a region that encapsulates our solar system. Great answer on, on the Oort cloud. Um, and okay, so 240,000 years plus one day to play hard to get. Exactly, yes, <laughs> one day of deliberation. Yeah, take a while, take a while to hear back from your, from your friend. Um, but okay, so uh, <laughs> um, I'm gonna, so yeah, that's the size of the Milky Way, 120,000 years. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I've put this in here, what do we definitely don't have time? This is a mold that was found growing on the, totally, nothing to do with space, really. Um, this is a mold that was found growing all over the Chernobyl reactor core. So the reactor that melted down in, in, in Chernobyl. Uh, this mold was found growing all over it. An amazing adaptation of life where it didn't need any food. Instead of food, it literally just fed off the radiation. Oh, I remember why I put this in here. Put this in here because in the future, we think that spaceships will have to be powered by nuclear power, and that we could, oh, sorry, and that we could use this mold, we could grow the mold all over the um, reactor core so that we can um, grow food as we like travel through space. Um, anyway, this 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 mold was found like chilling in some bird poo before. That's where it used to do its stuff before it kind of adapted to grow on to become like the first radioactive sense like mold able to eat radioactivity. Pretty cool, right? Um, anyway, so yes, the Milky Way, 120,000 light years. If we make that really small, we get to some like proper big galaxies like IC1101, great name for a galaxy. Five million years it would take light to get from one side to the other in that one. Anyway, if we make that crazy small, then we compare it to this. So finally, we're getting close to the stuff that I need to get to so I can talk to you about space expanding. Um, what do people reckon that space is? I'm gonna to start to move over here. Because this is kind of where we're heading. Um, what do people reckon that big circle was that was much, much bigger than, the, than that huge galaxy? And uh, while people are throwing in their answers, I'm just gonna catch up on a bit of chat. Um, and if you're joining us late, you're joining us really late because we are kind of approaching the end, but this is an Aim High Live. So just like throwing questions whenever you want. I'm gonna be doing this at 2 p.m. every weekday. And there are other people who are gonna do it at different times of the day as well. I'll tell you when those are gonna happen. But yeah, the next one will be on Monday at two. Um, Okay, Jeff's saying, so there are some cool ideas coming in. So the observable universe is coming in from a few and it's not the observable universe. We're actually not quite that big yet. Um, it, was it was still smaller than that. Uh, and so Jeff's saying the great attractor, which is the great attractor is this um, very mysterious thing that is um, kind of on the other side of the center of the galaxy from us. So we can't see it, but we know there's something on the other side of the center of our galaxy from us that is pulling loads of stuff in space towards it. And we just call it the Great Attractor and it's very mysterious. Um, and <laughs> Jasmine just said brunch is cancelled in response to that slow text message. <laughs> if that was the message, that'd be a bit underwhelming, wouldn't it? Um, okay, so uh, Fatima is saying the observable universe as well. So no, it's, it, this is something called the Eridanus Supervoid. Eri Darnus super void. I hope I spelled that right. I can't see any of it. <clears throat> um, so it's called the Eridanus super void because it's on the other side of the constellation called Eridanus. And it's this ridiculously big region in space that is totally empty. Totally empty. It's got nothing in it at all. And 
If you think this looks crazy big, then this is actually a fraction of the size of the bigger ones we've found since we discovered that one. Um, yeah, it's, it's big. Anyway, so just to, just to finish off on the size things, so that's the Eridanus supervoid, which is 500 million light years across, um, but that is it's quite small compared to, I'm gonna talk about this another time, but just remember that distance, because we're then gonna shrink that distance down, and that distance there is this size compared to the observable universe. So we've, we've arrived at this thing called the observable universe, um, and the observable universe isn't even the whole universe, so... <laughs> Even though I've given you all this size, the universe could be way, 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 way bigger than this. Um, right, so back to the Aerodynamic Supervoid, just very quickly. I wanted to show you this picture of space really zoomed out. Now, this was taken by a great photographer. I'm a real admirer of this person. You know, they've obviously lined up the shot really nicely here. They've got to a great place in deep space and they've absolutely snapped a, snapped a blinder. Um, in brackets, uh, this is just computer simulation because no one could take photographs like this. Um, but this is a simulation of what space looks like. And what you have, these kind of light bits here, these are the, I'm gonna get rid of the Aerodynamis Supervoid. Oops. Um, yeah, these, these light bits here are like clusters of stars. Um, <coughs> and clusters of galaxies. Sorry, they're clusters of galaxies, I mean. And so you see how when you zoom out in space, the galaxies string into these clusters like that. And then in between them are these huge spaces. Now these huge spaces are the ones that we call the supervoids. And the supervoids go kind of separate out these, these clusters of galaxies and the kind of strings that tie them together. And this is what the structure of space looks like. So some of the supervoids, as you can see, are much, much bigger than the others. Um, I actually got an even more zoomed out picture of space here where you can see like some properly big supervoids forming. Um, anyway, so there's a lot of stuff going on here with something called dark matter and something called dark energy. Um, helping to create this structure. And I'm gonna talk about both of those in another live that's coming up soon. Um, so rather than talking about those, I just wanna finally get to this question that I kind of promised I'd answer, which is um, if, if um, the universe is expanding, what's it expanding into? So it's something that a lot of people think about, right? If we've got this universe that's getting bigger and bigger, then what's outside it? And what do people think? Has anyone got any, any ideas of what they think or what they think about the question? Um, it's a big question, but I'm wondering if anyone has any thoughts, be they serious or not serious. <laughs> um, and, oh, someone is at, Bailey's actually here from New Zealand. Mate, it must be so late in New Zealand. I do need to run these earlier sometimes so that, so that people over there can come on. Um, And Jeff just really impressed his dad with those photos. Cool, glad to hear they're impressing the dads. Um, so yeah, if this is the universe, then what is outside the universe? So Izzy's coming in with nothingness, and that's that's all I've, that's all I'm seeing in the chat. Which is fair enough because it's a, that is that is the mystery of the whole thing. Now, what I'm going to do is ask you to kind of. Um, I know that I said, you know, come to this and I'll tell you what's what's outside the universe. But actually, what I wanted to reveal to you at this point, once we'd done that thing about scale, is that it's the wrong question. The question of if the universe is expanding, what's it expanding into is, is the wrong question. Because by asking that question, you are thinking in a way as if you're imagining that there is space beyond the universe for the universe to expand into. But space, the idea of space doesn't exist outside the universe. So if this is the universe here, then this is the only place where space and time even mean anything. So it's not that you kind of get to the edge and there's like an edge where it's then, it's then continuing to expand. It's that space and time don't even have a concept where there is no universe. And so even using words like outside the universe or beyond the edge of the universe, these things actually don't make sense. Now, remember that light, you might not have, you might not have done this before, but if, if you, so if you have, this will be a bit of a refresher, but if you haven't, then 
light always seems to go in straight lines. That's not a straight line. Light always seems to go in straight lines, but it's bent by gravity. So if you have like a huge gravitational field here, then instead of the light traveling in a straight line, it will feel itself as if it's traveling in a straight line, but actually it will bend around the gravity. It will bend around the objects that exist, the objects that, uh, that define space and time. So if light gets to the edge of the universe or it's approaching the edge, then by definition, it's going to start curving and curve back inwards because it will be curving towards where there is stuff, where there are objects which have some kind of gravity, where there are objects that define space and time. And so even light can't really escape this universe. And so talking about the edge of the universe in this way is kind of a, a weird, confusing thing that actually doesn't make any sense. And that might be a slightly disappointing thing to think about, that there isn't really an edge and that you can't really escape the universe. And also it might seem confusing in the sense that we also talked before about how the universe is continually expanding, but I'm afraid that's just how it is. Um, there's no point even thinking about what's outside the universe, because to think that is to, is to be asking the wrong question. More what you should be thinking about is how is the structure of the universe defined in terms of what it even means to be approaching a part of it where there is more on one side of you than the other? What does that even mean? Um, so yeah, I guess we will finish there. Um, thanks so much for coming everyone and uh, thanks for throwing so many questions in. It's, it's way more fun for me if, you, if there's like loads of people throwing in questions, so that was great. Uh, and I will be back on Monday. I think I'm doing uh, what is the worst parasite? Uh, what's the worst kind of parasite? Uh, and yes, do do give me any comments or feedback if you want me to have done things differently or you want it to be longer or shorter or whatever in the chat and I'll try and like change it. Also, if you want to put in ideas for topics um, and you, you want to hear about certain things or you want to ask me certain things, throw that in as well or go onto the Instagram, I think is the one of the ones that's like most closely monitored. So that's aim high live on Instagram. Um, if you're on Facebook, if you're watching on my Facebook, then follow the Aim High Lives page, which is the page on Facebook. And um, if you're on YouTube, then go to the website, which is www.aimhigh.co. In fact, you should all go there because that's where the calendar is, which tells you what's coming up. And you can also watch old lives that we did before on there if you'd like to. Um, yes, thanks so much for coming. Um, and uh, there are some great questions in here, which I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna copy some of the questions in here and try and reply to them next time. Like, is the universe expanding faster than light? Could it be infinite? And, uh, or, the, or would there be some Minecraft world border type business at the edge of the universe? Great questions. I'm gonna come back to these next time. Thanks for coming, everyone. I will see you after the weekend. Have good Easters. Farewell.